shoes. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in the finale of House of the Dragon Season 2. In the opening credits, we get a new scene. Vagar is surrounded by all of Rhaenyra's dragons. The first one we see is Cyrax, Rhaenyra's own dragon. I think the second dragon is Virmax, Jacerus' dragon. Then we see Caraxus. Next is Sea Smoke, and the large yellow dragon is Vermithor, the Bronze Fury. And then Moondancer and Silverwing. And then I think this massive dragon has to be Cannibal, who we have yet to see in the show. For the first time, we don't see anything underneath the titles. Originally, we saw threads who symbolized the story was still being written, and then there was blood and black ink. But now, there's nothing to symbolize the story is coming to a close, for now. We open on Tyrosh, one of the three Triarchy cities. Now, this is a bit different than the book. In the book, Otto Hightower actually forms an alliance with the Triarchy. We cut inside to the Triarchy leaders. They say, Those very stables and sculleries are carved into a mountain of gold. And we will need it before before this war is done. So, just like Westeros has legends about Essos, Essos has legends about Westeros. But is it true? It is, actually. We only briefly see Casterly Rock in Game of Thrones, and we don't get to see its mines. In the world of ice and fire, it says, hundreds of mine shafts penetrate the lower parts of the rock, where many veins of red and yellow glow gleam untouched. The Casterlies were the first to begin to carve halls and chambers from the mine shafts. The Lannisters are so rich because their castle is literally on a gold mine. I love that you can tell exactly where each each member of the Triarchy is from. This man is Lysini because of his white blonde hair. The people in Lys are the most closely related to the Valyrians and even the small folk have silver hair. This man is from Tyrosh since he's dyed his beard blue. And Tyroshi people are known for their extravagant and eclectic style. That means this man must be from Merv. And one thing I've always loved about this show is that it uses these natural settings. So it's important that they take this sweeping fantasy story but then ground it in real tactile locations. Like they film much of House of the Dragon and Game of Thrones in Northern Ireland which is why I'm visiting there later this month. Right, you are? I sure am. All right, you're gonna miss a lot of good TV while you're gone. No, I'm not, because while I'm traveling, I'm gonna use NordVPN to change my IP address to the United States or any other country I wanna stream programming from. You guys have probably felt this frustration, right? You already subscribe to a dozen streaming services, but the one thing you wanna watch is not streaming on any of them. But here's the thing, that show or movie is probably streaming on your service, just not in the United States. So you use NordVPN NordVPN to change your country, and voila, you can watch Starship Troopers on Disney+. Plus. NordVPN has so many features, and this is why I have been a loyal NordVPN customer for three years. You can add up to six devices on your account, and when you're traveling, it is crucial for mobile, next-generation encryption. And now, guys, for the next few days only, NordVPN is offering an amazing deal through our link below, nordvpn.com slash screencrush. When you sign up now, you get a huge discount on a two-year plan with four additional bonus months. But also, until August 8th, NordVPN is offering a voucher for up to 20 gigabytes from Saley, a worldwide eSIM data service. Nord is literally giving you an additional 20 gigs of cell data. That's more than my cell plan gives me monthly. You can use it on vacation this summer or just get a bunch of additional data to use at home. Guys, this is an incredible deal. So if you're thinking about signing up for NordVPN, I highly recommend you jump on this fast. NordVPN also has services like Threat Protection, which deletes shady downloads before they finish downloading, and their ad blocker is so great, it's the only ad blocker that I use. So to get your 20 gigabytes of free data, go to nordvpn.com slash screencrush for an exclusive discount through Screen Crush. Every purchase of a two-year NordVPN plan plus four additional months for free, and you will get for a limited time a voucher for up to 20 gigabytes of free data on Saley. Just click our link in the description. I highly recommend this, guys. It is a great deal. Now back to House of the Dragon. The Mirish Man says, Do you think that we lack for buyers for our tapestries and perfumes. Mir is renowned for their artistry and sell the best tapestries in the world. It actually got me thinking that the tapestries in the king's quarters are probably from Mir and depicting a Lysini pleasure house. The Tyrashi man says, Give us the stepstones. Now, it makes sense that he would say this because Tyrosh is actually part of the Stepstones. The constant war and Westerosi taxes would affect this city the most. Tylan says, Those rocks have been disputed for a generation. Which is a callback to the fact that Viserys literally was dealing with the Stepstones for his entire reign. We should address the latest developments in the Stepstones, my lords. Oh, will they ever be shut of that blasted place? And then we meet Lord Lohar. He says, Well met, Lord Tywin which is definitely a callback to Tywin Lannister in Game of Thrones. Also, Lord Lohar is played by fellow YouTuber Abigail Thorne from Philosophy Tube. I'll even wager that's why Lohar says this. What sort of man are you? 
a poet, a philosopher. Then we cut to Amid and Vagar. The city we're looking at is Sharp Point. Now, Sharp Point is just across the bay from Dragonstone, and it's controlled by House Massey. House Massey's been sworn to Dragonstone for years, and in fact, the handmaiden in King's Landing is actually Alyssa Massey. I love the symbolism of cutting from Aemon's war crimes on Sharp Point to a burned Aegon. Now, look, I'm not pretending Aegon is a great guy. He did awful things, but Aemon didn't maim him because he was a threat to the small folk or even because he was a bit of a tyrant. He hurt him because he was was embarrassed and angry. In his mind, his brother embarrassed him at a brothel, so he deserved to be burned with dragon fire. And Aemon thought the same thing with Sharp Point. Rhaenyra embarrassed him, so the people of Sharp Point deserve to die. He never grew past his childhood embarrassments, and now his only real aim is to prevent himself from ever being embarrassed again. And if you want to make sure that you're never embarrassed again, you should buy some of our new drip from our merch store. We have this awesome new metal hammer shirt, the Team Green and Team Black baseball tees, this forget about the iron fleet RPG shirt and the Battle of the Twins shirt to commemorate their epic fight. Shopping our merch store is the best way to support our channel so we can keep making videos just like this one for you guys. Thank you so much for everything you do to support our channel. The links are in the description. Now, on a separate note, I love how they've used Aegon's healing as a timeline for us. We can gauge how much time has passed between episodes based on how bad his wounds are. Another interesting thing is that his face is actually injured on the opposite side of King Viserys. He's not a spitting image of his father, but rather a mirror image, and that makes sense because they're opposites. Viserys was too cautious and that made him weak, while Aegon was too hot-headed and that made him reckless. Aegon says, My c*** is destroyed, did they tell you that? Now, he isn't just saying that because he lost the pleasure of sex, but because he is now unable to produce a male heir. In the book, he had two sons, but it seems like here he only had Jaehaerys. So, even if he were to take the throne, his heir would always be Aemond, or, if he was imprisoned, Daeron. But Aegon's legacy dies with him, no matter what. Laris goes through a list of new monikers for Aegon. Aegon the Peacemaker. Aegon the Rebuilder. Which is a callback to earlier in the season. Hail King Aegon! The Magnanimous. But then Aegon says, Aegon the realm's delight. In the book, that was what the common folk called Rhaenyra when she was a child. He's always been jealous of the attention that Rhaenyra received from Viserys, and now he literally wants to take her name with the common folk. Back on Dragonstone, we cut to all of the bastards. Ulf says, I might never eat fish again. A reference to the blockade in King's Landing, which made it impossible to get meat. Now, Ulf is just an idiot. Let them tell us we don't have Targaryen blood, eh? And he doesn't seem mean-spirited. He just seems dumb. But that ultimately will grow the bad blood between the lowborn bastards and the crown. Later in the episode, Rhaenyra tries to politely correct him. A knight will comport himself with grace at the queen's table. Best make me a knight, then. But Jace is just outright hostile. If you hinder our efforts through sloth or unreadiness, I will see you hanged and your body fed to the dogs in the street. Now that's a huge issue because it makes it abundantly clear that the blacks are just using them. Ulf, Hugh, and Adam are good enough to die for them, but not good enough to actually be treated with respect. In fact, the prince outright disdains them, even though he is a bastard himself. Why would they want to keep fighting for the blacks when they receive this treatment? We cut to Rhaenyra on Driftmark. Corliss mentions Dreamfire and Rhaenyra says, Helena, she does not ride. She has no taste for it. Now, that's actually a huge difference from Fire and Blood. In the book, Helena was a dragon rider from an early age, and according to George R.R. Martin, her greatest joy in life is to take to the skies on her dragon, Dreamfire. Show Helena and book Helena are pretty different. Even George R.R. Martin said it. So my guess is that they changed this aspect so Aemon would seem more cruel when he asked her to fly. Also, quick history lesson on Dreamfire. She hatched during the reign of Aegon the Conqueror and was actually ridden by Raina Targaryen, Aegon the Conqueror's daughter, prior to Helena. Corliss says, I've given her a new name. Queen who never was. Aw, they're so cute. I know, it's adorable, but I will say this line, What I do now, I do for her troubles me. Corliss is basically saying that he has no real loyalty to Rhaenyra, and while it's heartwarming that he's honoring his wife, it's a bit sketchy because Rhaenys and Rhaenyra did not have the best relationship. They worked together at the end, but it was despite their bad blood. We cut to Harrenhal, and for the first time, it actually looks like a functioning castle. Daemon had a spiritual journey this season, and it's reflected in the castle itself. It stood near empty for the majority of the season, and it was only once Daemon learned to let go of his ego that it actually filled with other people. Daemon says, Lannister hesitates. I aim to march on King's Landing before he can catch me. A reference to Jason Lannister's army stationed at Crackclaw. Lord Broom tries to tempt Daemon in the Godswood, which is very symbolic given what Alice Rivers shows him, but we'll get into that later in the video. Back in the Red Keep, Helena confesses, I was happier before I was queen. 
And I love how sad Alicent looks for her. She understands. She was happier before she was queen too. We rarely see Alicent happy in this series, but when she smiled the most was prior to her marriage. When she's with Rhaenyra in those first few episodes, it's almost hard to remember that it's her. But as soon as they announce her marriage to Viserys, she starts looking sullen. Also, notice that Alicent is wearing blue. Last week, I mentioned that ever since she's been married, she's only worn colors to represent the house she was supporting. Red and black for Targaryen, and then green for the Hightowers. But before she was forced into the political game, she almost always wore blue. Blue reappearing in her wardrobe now is a sign that she is regaining her autonomy. Aemon comes looking for Helena, and she says, I won't burn anyone implying that she knows what Aemon did to Aegon. When Aemon grabs Helena, notice that he says, They have defiled our birthright. It's not even that Rhaenyra now has more dragons and might take the throne. It's that there are bastard dragon riders. Jaceres worries about his own place as a bastard now that there are bastard dragon riders, but in reality, their existence threatens everyone. The Targaryens justify their rule by claiming that they're closer to gods than men. It's their own version of divine right. But if any Targaryen at any station can become a dragon rider, well, then why should they rule? Allison says, you wish to rule the Seven Kingdoms, but you rain ruin and death upon its small folk when you've been insulted. Which echoes what the sex worker warned against earlier this season. I would remind you only that when princes lose their temper, it is often others who suffer. The small folk. She also says, And now you seek to corrupt your sister. Of all our line, the gentlest and most deserving. So why is Helena so much nicer than the rest of them? Well, because she was never roped into the political game the way her brothers were. She was used as a pawn, but she was never plotting or scheming like the rest of her family, and it allowed her to retain a kind heart. Then there's this exchange. And so, who will she be if her mind is broken? It is no longer our rule that is threatened. Our very lives, would you not have us prevail? Not like this. Which hints to Alicent agreeing for Aegon to die at the end of the episode. We cut to Kristen Cole, holding the handkerchief that Alicent gave him when he first set out to battle. When Gawain tries to call out his affair, Cole says, She saved my life. Twice. Now this is a reference to the first season. The first time she spared his life is when she allowed him to serve despite sleeping with Rhaenyra. And the second time, she stopped him from suicide after he killed Joffrey. He also says, Since then she has been the beacon I follow. A reference to the Hightower Crest. Now notice what Cole says here. Or rather my philosophy was this, to protect the righteous and dispense justice on the rest. The dragons dance, and men are like dust under their feet. Now that he's seen the dragons fight, he regrets his part in the war. And let's be clear, he had a part in the war long before he ever went to battle. He drove the wedge between Rhaenyra and Alicent by acting as an echo chamber for Alicent's own hate. The princess Rhaenyra is brazen and relentless. A spider who stings and sucks her prey dry. And he drove their children apart by favoring Aemond and Aegon. His justification was that Rhaenyra was unhonorable and therefore she deserved to be punished. She deserved justice. That would be hypocrisy. But in driving this wedge, he put his own moral code and need for honor above the actual lives that would be lost in war. And to highlight his point, he cleans his sword, a superficial way of reclaiming his honor and purity. Meanwhile, in Tyrosh, Lord Tyland is on the side quest of a lifetime. And I think side quests are just a Lannister thing. I couldn't help but think of like Tyrion becoming friends with the Mountain Clans in season one. If the Halfman betrays us, Shaga, son of Dolph, will cut off his manhood. And feed it to the goats, yes. We cut back to Dragonstone. So I love the details of Bela's costuming. Her necklace looks like dragon teeth with blood, and at the center of her dress, it's patterned to look like scales. It's really interesting that both Aemond and Jace have the same issue with the bastards. They find them insulting, and Aemond always found bastards insulting, and Jace included. Let us drain our cups to these three Strong boys. So it's weird to see Jace in Aemon's shoes, but it highlights that fundamentally all of the Targaryens feel entitled. While Aemon and Aegon are more visibly spoiled, it is a trait with all the royal children. Jace thinks that he is better than bastards, even though he is also a bastard. It's a sacred inheritance of which you know nothing. And Bela is quick to say that she is not common. Then that does not make me common. Or you. The Blacks say that they want to win this war for the common people, but they fundamentally think that they are still better than the common people. At dinner, Ulf sits at one of the heads of the table, a seat typically reserved for a matriarch and patriarch. It's a subtle show of self-aggrandizement. Also, notice how formally Rhaenyra is dressed. She has dragon pauldrons and is even wearing her crown. She is using her clothing to symbolize her status to the bastard riders. I also love the addition of the animal bones and fool birds on the table. For the season one wedding feast, the set designer said, it's pretty gruesome, but I wanted to show the savagery of 
these characters and these people once they've had a few drinks. And they're doing the same thing here. The upper class think of themselves as different from the lower class, but truly, they are just as carnal as the rest of them. The disparity between them is further highlighted when Rhaenyra suggests attacking strongholds. The strongholds of the usurper, Old Town and Lannisport, and their armies all must be subdued. The people who will die in these attacks are common folk, the very people she has sworn to protect, and the very people who are now sharing her table. Then they get a message from Harrenhal. Damon has raised his army. But Sir Simon fears treachery. And I love this little petulant head toss that Rhaenyra does when she finds out. It's almost like a teenager, which makes sense because she was a teenager when their relationship started. In some ways, she's still stuck at that age when she is with Damon. We cut back to Harrenhal, and man, I was right. Alice was working with the children of the forest. I also think this implies that there is a hideout for the Children of the Forest beneath Harrenhal, which means maybe they didn't go extinct in Season 6 when Leaf blew up the cave. Damon touches the tree. Ew, why does it look like it's bleeding? <laughs> well, weirwood trees have this really dark red sap. Centuries ago, the Children of the Forest carved faces into these heart trees. Because weirwood is such a long-lasting tree, these carvings lasted, and now the sap oozes out around these cuts. Also, in Game of Thrones, we learned that these trees hold memories of both the future and the past which is why Damon has this vision. In this vision, Damon sees the three-eyed raven from Game of Thrones, but he's much, much younger here, still in the same chair though. In Game of Thrones, we never learned his real name, but in the books, his original name was Brendan Rivers, a Targaryen bastard. I also think that his port wine stain symbolized that he is touched by the red sap of the weirwood. The camera flies into the three-eyed raven's eye, and we switch perspective to a warg. You can even hear the dire wolf growling in the background. And then we see a White Walker, the infamous villains from Game of Thrones. Now, the White Walkers were actually created by the Children of the Forest. The Andals were destroying the children and their sacred trees, the Weirwoods. They tried to create a new sentient weapon, but instead created the White Walkers, who ultimately wanted to consume both the Children of the Forest and men. And then we see Maylise's corpse, and behind her there are more dead dragons, symbolizing the dragons that they have yet to lose. And in the very background, you can even see the Red Keep. And then we see the Red Comet from Game of Thrones. Osha, a Wildling says, Red Comet means one thing, boy. Dragons. And boy, was she right. Next are Daenerys' eggs in the funeral pyre and the scene when they hatch in season one. Now, I am curious if Damon knew this was Danny or if he thought it was Rhaenyra. After all, from the back, it's difficult to tell, and he's been having visions of Rhaenyra throughout his entire stay at Harrenhal. And the very next shot we see is Rhaenyra on the Iron Throne. It's a reasonable logical leap. And then he sees Helena. So for this entire show, Helena has shown a gift for prophecy. The flesh weaving dragons of thread. Now, this Targaryen gift did not begin in Westeros. The entire reason the Dragon Lords left Valyria was because Daenys the Dreamer foresaw the doom of Valyria. But my guess is that Dragon Dreamers connect more easily with Westeros and the Children of the Forest than other people. This could even explain why Brendan Rivers became the Three-Eyed Raven. And I also love the line, It's all a story. It's almost a meta look at Westeros. She knows that ultimately their entire lives and the entire Targaryen dynasty will just be written into a narrative propagated by the Maesters. And in universe, that's all fire and blood is, just the westeros version of a pop history book. We don't get to see their inner lives, their motivations, or what makes them human. We just hear quick descriptions of them and what they did during the Dance of the Dragons. Their entire personhood is pressed into just that, a story, nothing more and nothing less. I also love how it cuts to Helena seemingly talking to the air in the Red Keep. Helena's always been weird, seemingly talking to herself all the time, but now I wonder if she was always talking to other people that she connected with through the heart tree. For instance, could she have been communicating with Bran Stark years in the future, even after he becomes King of the Seven Kingdoms? Aemon tries to sway Helena again, and if you look closely, he's almost crying. What a brilliant decision. Aemon craves closeness. We know that from his desperation to be accepted by his siblings and cousins when he was a child, and from his relationship with the sex worker as an adult, but he's so damaged that he has no idea how to seek intimacy. Ultimately, Aemon wants family, including Helena. Even as a child, he was nicer to her than his brother. She's an idiot. She's your future queen. But instead of approaching Helena on an emotional level, he frames it as duty and honor because that's all he knows. That's all his mother taught him. We cut to Harrenhal. Rhaenyra swooping down on Dragonback to confront Damon reminded me of the last time she did this as a teenager on Dragonstone. Daddy Brostas, Kesu Uglesa, Luon Zombas, Mianu Isa. 
As Cyrax descends, we see multiple Riverland crests, including House Mooton of Maidenpool, House Vance of Wayfarer's Rest, House Bracken, and of course, House Tolly. Also, we get some great costume details on Rhaenyra. First of all, her lapels have two dragons on them, both curving down menacingly. And also, look at how the fabric is a very dark red. This could symbolize her intentions and methods becoming darker and darker. She walks into Harrenhal, and of course, Cyrax is close behind her. Take care not to startle Cyrax, my lords. She's rather protective of me. Now, this entire scene is basically a reversal of the series opening scene with Jaehaerys. In that scene, Jaehaerys sat on the other end of the hall and let the lords tell him what to do. But now, Daemon is on the other side of the hall and he is following his heart. And with this, Daemon's Hall arc finally comes to a close. He started out as an arrogant, self-centered, and egotistical man, and now he's able to put his own ego and thirst for power aside for the greater good. I also loved Daemon's speech, and I've said it over and over again. Rhaenyra is good at politics, and Daemon is good at war. This really highlights that. Rhaenyra found new dragon riders and formed new alliances, but she can't inspire an army the way that Daemon can. Let me be clear, that's not a bad thing. It's great that they can work together and each play to their strengths. Back on Driftmark, Corliss has his first confrontation with Alan. I am trying to help you. You want to help me? Is this the help you offer after all these years? A reminder to be grateful. Now, this is important because it's a preview of what could happen with all of the bastards. They have every reason to resent the Targaryens. They abandoned them completely. Adam and Alan could barely eat. Ulf suffered an injury. Hugh's daughter died. And the Targaryens were never there for them. Now, so far, Rhaenyra has been spared the worst of this judgment because they aren't her children, unlike Corlys. But ultimately, these are the sins of her family. They have every right to resent her. Also, small costuming detail, Corlys's belt buckle is made to resemble a seashell. We cut back to Dragonstone and look, the sky puppies are playing. Vesaria says, The gods favor you. Last week, I talked a lot about the double entendres of dragons and gods. The dragons are viewed as gods by a lot of people in Westeros, so anytime there's a mention of dragons and gods, there's always a question. Are they referring to the gods of the seven or the dragons as gods themselves? When Rhaenyra says her father wouldn't want this, Missaria says, He left you with no choice. And to be fair, this war is partially his fault. He was a weak ruler and while he tried to heal the divisions in his family, he let the high towers grab for power nearly unchecked, especially as he got older. The truth is, every single person in this story had a part in the war, and while no one person could stop it, they all helped to start it. It's like Renée said, Soon they will not even remember what it was that began the war in the first place. And then we get to the surprise reveal of Alicent. So before we get into the scene, notice the light blue color of her dress. Earlier in the episode, I mentioned that her blue dress represented that she was getting her autonomy back. But even then, she was wearing dark blue. When she was younger, dark blue only appeared in her wardrobe as she was pulled into the political game. Now, she's wearing light blue, reminiscent of her earliest dresses when she was still innocent and happy. She's finally fully rinsed herself of the political agenda that kept her ensnared and unhappy for years. Also, Rhaenyra is wearing brown, removing herself from the colors of her house as well. This subtlety hints that they're not meeting as representatives of their houses. They are just meeting as themselves. Allison says, I did not know what I wanted. And it shows how they've really come full circle. One of their first conversations was about what Rhaenyra wanted. I want to fly with you on Dragonback, see the great wonders across the narrow sea and eat only cake. Even at that young age, Alicent was already concerned about politics and stations, while Rhaenyra was unabashed about her desires. Then they have this exchange. Yes, but you alone made virtue your banner. And I clung to it. In defiance of you, I think, you so disdained it. Allison's emphasis on virtue was a coping mechanism to deal with the fact that she had no say in her own life. She had to believe that she was holier than thou in order to live with her own subjugation at the hands of all the men around her. She also says, I have been alone of late. Which is a sentiment also echoed when Rhaenyra and Alicent briefly reconciled as teenagers. I find I have a few friends lately. Then Allison says, I do not wish to rule, I wish to live. And this is a sentiment echoed by several characters in this episode. Helena rejects fighting, even though it would cost her her queenship. Damon bends the knee to Rhaenyra because he saw the long night. Alan rejects help from Corlys, preferring to live the life that he's made for himself. Even Aegon and Larys flee the council to keep their lives. This episode really sifted out who wants to rule, Rhaenyra and Aemon versus who's acting out of survival. They discuss whether Rhaenyra would have been challenged, and this goes back to to what I said earlier. No one person could stop this war, but every single person helped to start it. All of them have blood on their hands. Like Allison said, Nothing is clean here. 
Then we get this great shot of Allison framed beneath the dragon skull. Throughout this entire season, there's been an emphasis that humans are nothing in the face of dragons. But this scene questions that. Allison is not a dragon rider. She's tiny in front of these beasts. But she, a regular person, plots to take down two dragon riders, her own sons. The emphasis on the small folk this season proved that people still matter. And Allison proves that humans still have agency against dragon riders. She also chews her cuticle, which was a common nervous tick in her youth. Then she tells Rhaenyra how to march on King's Landing. Helena as queen will be the crown's authority. If you come then to King's Landing, I will see to it that our guards throw down their arms. We will open the gates. We will shed no blood. You will enter as a conqueror. And this is a perfect reversal of what she said in the first episode of this season. And how would you define victory? Rhaenyra bending the knee and Aegon sitting there on the throne in peace. Rhaenyra says, If I am to take the throne, I must put an end to the opposition. I must take Aegon's head. And it's so ironic. Alicent was so worried that Rhaenyra would kill her kids. If Rhaenyra comes into power, your very life could be forfeit. But the truth is, Rhaenyra had no desire or motivation to kill them. If they hadn't challenged her throne, she would have never hurt them. But Alicent pushed for her kids to be on the throne. It's her actions that led to the threat on Aegon's life. And she's the one who ultimately decides that he should die. Rhaenyra says, And what do I do with you now? Yeah, why don't you just let her walk away? Well, because of this line. Or you take me for a liar. Remember, in episode three, Alicent said this. I have been at times unkind, but never untrue. And even Rhaenyra agreed. Rhaenyra says, History will paint you a villain. And this is what we see in Fire and Blood. Alicent is not depicted with any nuance in the book. She is just the villain. Like Helena said, it's all a story and they're all reduced to their parts. Also, notice that Alicent says this. Cast myself on the mercy of a friend who once loved me. Now, I wondered why they showed us this kiss between Rhaenyra and Missaria a few episodes ago because it hasn't grown into anything. But now, I think it was just to let us know that Rhaenyra is attracted to women. She had a crush on Alicent when she was younger, and honestly, it was pretty clear in their interactions. I want to fly with you on Dragonback. So, her marriage to Viserys was not only a betrayal, it broke Rhaenyra's heart. Oh, that's so sad. It really is. Also, I think the crush was reciprocated based on this line. Come with me. The only other person who's asked her to run away with them is Sir Kristen Cole, and it was romantic. Now, I guess it could be gals being pals, but I don't think the parallel is a coincidence. We end the episode with Alicent leaving. It doesn't matter what they had in the past. As they both said, it's too late. The final shots of the episode are everybody suiting up for war. There's Hugh in his armor with these three swirls, representing the three conquerors, which inspired our hammer dragon shirt. Adam of Hall's armor looks more like scales to represent his fishing background. Ulf gets the same brooch as Jace to symbolize that they're both truly cut from the same cloth, as he said earlier. You and I, cut from the same cloth. And then, oh my god, we see Tessarion for the first time. Woohoo! New dragon. Wow, we saw Darren's dragon before we even saw him. Yeah, talk about being overshadowed. The Frey Alliance made earlier in the season comes back, and look, the Starks are also here. I don't care if they're Greybeards, I would not want to fight them. Jason Lannister and his army finally moved on from the Golden Tooth. Big deal because it means that Alicent was telling the truth. Jason said he would not leave until Vagar joined them. Tell my brother we are ready to march as soon as Prince Aemon is able to join us. We also see the Red Fork of the River, which Jason mentioned previously. By the time we are finished with the Riverland scum, the Red Fork will have earned its name. And of course, that is Hall in the distance. And then, oh my God, guys, we see Sheep Stealer. It has to be him based on his book description, a notably ugly mud brown dragon. No offense, but that is not an attractive dragon. We find out that Otto Hightower was captured. My guess says that he was caught by someone supporting the Blacks, and I bet that his capture will drive a wedge between Rhaenyra and Alicent again next season. We see Rhaenyra facing the skull of the dragon, and notice her back is turned to the history texts that are behind her. Remember, this isn't the first time the dragons went to war. Everybody knows it always ends up bloody. Rhaenyra literally turning her back on history represents her hubris. She still thinks that for her, it's going to be different. We end the season with Alicent looking out towards the sunset on Dragonstone. On one hand, she's looking out at her new life, but on the other hand, the sun is setting on both Dragonstone and the High Tower. The darkness is coming. I loved that season, guys, and I just have to give a major shout out to the person who wrote all of these videos, Brianna McLarty. In the past few months, she has written more than 40,000 words about House of the Dragon. Thank you guys so much for watching this season with us and watching all of our videos. It has been 
awesome writing for everybody and I really appreciate all the support. If you want to follow me, I am on TikTok and Instagram at Brianna T. McClarty. And again, thank you guys so much. This has been such a great experience. And Brianna, you have done a phenomenal job. So guys, what did you think about this season? If you have any questions for us, you can add us on our socials or just comment below. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.